Hello, AP Bio. So this video is going to be a little bit different from the ones that we normally do. So in class today, what we were going to be doing was taking some notes actually on what it means for a gene to be linked. So what I want to do, instead of doing this on the board, I'm going to do it on a piece of notebook paper. So I need you to go get a piece of notebook paper, get a pen or pencil. If you don't have that handy, just pause the video and unpause it once you are ready. Okay, so you just write down what I write down. We're going to go through some notes and go through an example of what it means for genes to be linked and how you know if they are linked. So I want you to begin by titling this page, how do I know if two genes are linked? Okay, and just to review, linked means that they're on the same chromosome. We're gonna do this by going through an example Punnett square. And in my example, I want to have big B stand for black hair. Again, you just write what I write. And little B stand for red hair. But this is going to be dihybrid. I also want to have a big G stand for green eyes. And a little G stand for blue eyes. OK? And we're going to have a dad who is big B, little B, big G, little G, which again would be black hair and green eyes. And we're gonna have a mom who is gonna be little B, little B, little G, little G. And I'm running out of room, so let's just draw an arrow here to point out that this mom has red hair, and blue eyes. Okay, so so far this is just like a normal pun and square question. So as is our tradition, we're going to begin by making gametes. Um, the dad is heterozygous for everything, so he can produce four different gametes. He can produce a big G or a big B with a big G, a big B with a little G, a little B with a big G, or a little B with a little G. The mom is homozygous recessive for everything. So she can only produce a little b and a little g, okay? So far, nothing about this is different from what we've done in class. So this would be a four by one box Punnett square. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw it actually kind of big this time. You'll see why in a minute. We're gonna put the mom's gamete there and the dad's gametes are again, big, 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 little, little, big. A little. Okay, so let's just pause for a second to make sure you're you're caught up. I have a four by one Punnett square. I'm gonna hit a quick button, make sure this is focused good. Okay, now we're just gonna do the Punnett square. So this would be big little, big little, big little, 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 big little, 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 little. Right? And I made this box big because I want to actually write the phenotypes. So this individual would have black hair and green eyes. That says green. This individual would have black hair and blue eyes. This individual would have red hair and green eyes. This individual would have red hair and blue eyes. Okay. And in class, if I asked you for what the ratio would be, you would say it would be a one to one to one to one ratio. All right. It's the typical dihybrid um, Punnett square. Okay. So let's say that we had a thousand people. This mom and dad had a whole lot of offspring. If there were a thousand people, what would my expected results be? All right. I have a thousand people, you would expect to have 250 like that, 250 like that, 250 like that, and 250 like that. It is a one to one to one ratio. Okay. Now let's say that I actually did this cross. And my actual numbers were different. Let's say I had 400 
black and green, um, 100 black and blue, 100 red and green, and 400 red and blue. Okay, so let's just pause for a second and compare my actual results to what I thought would happen. So I thought it would be one to one to one to one, but it's not. I have way more of this type and way more of this type. Now look at this for a second. The two phenotypes that have 400 flies, what do they have in common compared to the parents? So this 400, these are black and green. They're not flies, they're, these are people. Um, 400 black and green, then I have 400 red and blue. What were the parents? Weren't the parents, going back up here, the dad had black hair and green eyes, the mom had red hair and blue eyes. So going back here, this is called a parental type. I'm gonna call that PT, because those 400 are the same phenotype as the dad was, who was a parent, black hair and green eyes right? This last one, these 400, I'm going to call this a parental type because these 400 had red hair and blue eyes, which was like the mom. So the ones that have the most numbers are the ones that are the same phenotypes to the parents. Now this 100 has black hair and blue eyes, which is like a new combination. We're going to call that an RT, which stands for recombinant type. And the same for this one, okay? So a parental type just means an offspring that is just like one of the parents. A recombinant type is an offspring where you've rearranged the genes, all right? The dad had black hair and green eyes. The mom had red hair and blue eyes. Could those parents have a kid with black hair and blue eyes, which is a new combination, or with red hair and green eyes? It's a new combination. The answer, of course, is, is yes, they can, okay? But the question is, I'm gonna put a big question mark right here. Why am I not getting a one to one to one to one ratio? The answer is, I'm gonna write this down, is that these two genes, the genes are on the same chromosome, which means that they are linked, all right? Genes that are linked means they're on the exact same chromosome. I remember, remember back when we did meiosis, we discussed independent assortment um, when the tetrads line up during metaphase of meiosis metaphase one, if two genes are on the same chromosome, they can't independently assort. And we're going to draw what that means in just a minute. Okay, so the AP exam gave you a question with data that you should be getting a one to one to one to one ratio. If you don't, and we're going to do a sample in just a minute, it's because the genes are linked. All right, your evidence would be I don't get a one to one to one to one ratio, I have way more parental types that I do recombinant types, okay? Now, quick question, I'm gonna write this down. What if the question said, what is the frequency of recombination? All right, what is the frequency of recombination? This is actually a super simple problem. All you do is take the number of recombinant types and divide it by the total number of individuals, all right? How many recombinant types were there? There were 200 recombinant types. How many people were there total? There were 1,000 total people. So the frequency of recombination is 20%, okay? What would the frequency be if you actually had a one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one -to -one ratio? It'd be 50%, right? Going back here, if I actually got um, if I got this data, the, the 250 for each, it would be 500 over 1,000, it would be 50%. So genes that are on different chromosomes have a recombination frequency of 50%, 50% recombinant types, 50% parental types. Genes that are on the same chromosome would have obviously less than 50%. So your evidence for this being genes that are linked is because you have more parental types than recombinant types, and you have a pretty low frequency of recombination here is 20%. Now, another question, I'm gonna flip this over to the back. Question number two, what if they asked how far apart, how far apart are the genes on their chromosome? All right, 
how far apart are these two genes on the same chromosome? It's very easy. All you do is you write down the recombination frequency, and it was 20%, and that turns into what are called 20 MAP units. That's it. It's just the, the frequency of recombination with the unit of MAP units. So if I had a 10% recombination frequency, that would be 10 MAP units. And the deal here is the further away the, the flies are, the further away the two genes are, the more they recombine. If you had a 50% recombination frequency, that basically tells you that they're on different chromosomes. Okay. All right, now I'm gonna draw a quick line. I want to do something else real quick. I want to compare, write this down, compare non-linked and linked genes. All right, and I actually wanna draw a picture, all right? Let's say I had two genes that were not linked, okay? And we're gonna use the same big B, little b, big G, little g that we used before. So my dad on the previous page, if you remember, the dad was big B, little b, big G, little g, all right? And these are gonna be on different chromosomes. So I'm gonna draw one chromosome for my dad. Say it's chromosome number five, I don't know. You have two copies because one came from mom, one came from dad. Say this is the one from his dad. It's gonna have the little b or the big b. One from his mom's gonna have the little b, okay? They're on different chromosomes. Um, well, here you have, this would be a, a homologous pair of chromosomes. They're in the same place on chromosomes, say 10 for mom, 10 for dad. Then I'm going to draw a different chromosome. We're going to make this one a little bit shorter just to show that they're different from the first one. Say this is chromosome number 20. And the dad had a big G and the dad had a little g. Okay. So these are two different chromosomes. Um, and again, this is showing the homologous pair. Now, these are, are obviously not duplicated chromosomes. This would be how they would appear in G1 of the cell cycle. Okay, so that's what the dad had. So the mom in the problem, the mom's genotype, which are all the same chromosomes as the dad had, the mom had a little b, little b. And for this chromosome pair, the mom had a little g, little g. Okay. So let's say this is chromosome number five. I'm making these up. This is chromosome number 20. I'm just making these up. You have two copies because you're diploid. The dad has big B, little b, big G, little g. The mom has little b, little b, little g, little g. This is what the, the, the gametes would look like, not the gametes, what the cells would look like if the genes were not linked, okay? Now, let me draw a line right here. What would they look like if they were linked, okay? Dad versus mom. What they are linked, that means they're on the exact same chromosome. So I'm gonna draw, say, say they're both on chromosome number five. And again, I'm just making up the chromosome numbers, all right? The dad, say the B is there and say the G is somewhere else on the same chromosome. And here the dad has a big little B and a little G. And again, the mom is a little B, little G. Okay, so if the chromosomes, if the genes are not linked, it looks like this. All right. If the genes are linked, it means they're on the same chromosome. So what this means is that with if this dad in a sperm gives a child a big B, he also gives them a little, or I'm sorry, if the dad gives a big B, he also gives a big G. If the dad gives a little B, he also gives a little G. The chances of this dad giving an offspring a big B and a little G, which is a dagamy, remember the dad can produce the data can produce a big B little G, right? But if they're on the same chromosome, the chances of that are, are lower because they're physically attached to one another, okay? So the question is, in this scenario, I'm gonna write this down. In this scenario, can you have independent assortment? When the genes are not linked, you can see what I was writing. Can B and G independently assort here? The answer is yes. Can B and G independently assort here? And the answer is no. I realize I put the adverb version here. 
So if the genes are not linked, you have independent assortment, right? If the genes are linked, you don't have independent assortment, okay? Now, one big note though, let's put a big but. But, all right, there were some recombinant types. There were some There were some recombinant types. Remember how we said this dad can't give a big B and a little g because they're on different chromosomes? But there were some that got that. And the answer is because of, I'm going to write it big, because of crossing over. All right. Crossing over would switch homologous portions of, of or the same portion of homologous chromosomes. So imagine a crossing over event here where I swapped that part in that part. So the top and the bottom of those sections switched. Can that dad give a big G, a big B and a little G? The answer is yes. If it weren't for crossing over, you couldn't have any, any recombinant types at all. Now, why do you have fewer recombinant types than parental types? Because not everything does crossing over. Now, what dictates the frequency of which two genes are going to cross over? It's how far apart they are. The further apart two genes are, the more likely that they're going to cross over. Okay, now let's pause for a sec. And if you had handy out the genetics packet that we've been doing, I want to do this is page, it says 11 dot, dot six at the bottom, a couple recombination questions. Now, this might seem really, really confusing. Um, but when you're doing these questions, there's actually a pretty, pretty simple, let's get this in really good focus, a little bit better. There's really a pretty simple way to do this. Hang on just a second. Because there's a pattern. All right, let's look at number one. In Drosophilia melanogaster, those are fruit flies, there is a dominant gene for gray body color and another dominant gene for normal wings. The recessive alleles of those two genes result in black body color and vestigial wings. Vestigial wings are like short and like shriveled up, the fly can't fly. Flies homozygous for gray body and normal wings were crossed with flies that had black bodies and vestigial wings. The F1 progeny were then test crossed with the following results. All right. Now on the AP exam, if you see a question like this, this is, this is like a dead giveaway that this is a linked gene question. The question also asks you right here, are the two genes linked? Okay. So here's what you do to figure out if, if the two genes are linked. You mark in the data, mark the parental types versus the recombinant types. Now it tells me, what was the cross? Flies homozygous for gray body and normal wings. So gray body and normal wings, this is a parental type. We're crossed with flies that had black bodies and vestigial wings. This is a parental type which means that's a recombinant type and that's a recombinant type, okay? That's a P right there. So the parental types were just like the parents. So that's a parental type and that's a parental type. The recombinant types are the two in the middle. Whoa, whoa, I did that wrong. Someone stop me, you can't stop me. This, okay, you know what? Let's scratch this out. This is a parental type. This is a parental type, right? Gray body and normal wings, that's that one. We're crossed with black bodies and vestigial wings. That's this one. These two are the recombinant types. There we go. Make sure we mark those correctly. Now, are the two genes linked? The answer is yes, they're linked. If it wanted evidence why, you would say because you have more parental types than recombinant types. How many map units apart are they? Remember the, the equation is, um, well, what you figure out is the recombination frequency, 50 plus 61 is what, I know I can do it in my head, but I don't trust my head. 50 plus 61 is 111. How many total flies? Remember, this was the recombinant types divided by the total. That's what I'm doing here. The total number of flies, 236 plus 253 plus 50 plus 60 is 600. 
So the recombination frequency is 111 divided by 600. And of course, times it by 100. That's 18.5%. So the mapping units is 18.5 map units. OK? Let's do another one. Let's do number three. I have a nematode, a nematode, I can't pronounce that name. I have two genes that are recessive, which confer the phenotypes of a dumpy body and uncoordinated movement, respectively. A test cross is performed and yields the following progeny. So I look at this and look at the numbers. My NSEQ right now says that, that this is linked. So remember, wild type just means what's found in nature. So the wild type is a parental type. And it says you cross them with a dumpy body and an, an, an uncoordinated movement. So this is dumpy, uncoordinated. So that's a parental type. These would therefore be recombinant types. Like that. This would be dumpy coordinated. This would be um, not dumpy, uncoordinated. So are these two gene, are these genes linked? The answer is yes, because you have more parental than recombinant types. How many map units apart? Well, let's add them up. The total number of worms is 999. The recombinant types is 199. That is 19.9%. Uh, so how many map units apart are there? 19.9 map units, all right? For question four, we can, we can do question four fast. Same scenario, look at the data. Are these genes linked? The answer is no. Why not? Because you had the same number, more or less, of uh, recombinant types versus parental types. If you add these up, you can, you, you can do the math. It's about 50% recombinant type, 50% um, parental type. Now let's really quick do number two. Number two, a series of dihybrid crosses gives the following crossover frequencies. And you can read that. Got a piece of paper here. Um, a and B is 3%, A and C is 13%, B and C is 10%. Let me grab a piece of paper real quick. Question A, what's the gene sequence? We're going to do this one. What's the gene sequence? So this is just kind of like a logic puzzle, right? A and B are three apart. A and C are 13 apart. B and C are 10 apart. So let's just draw a chromosome. Let's draw a chromosome. How can I label these so that those numbers come out um, 3, 13, and 10? So let's just first, let's just put an A. There's gene A. A and B had to be three units apart. So let's put a B there. That's three units apart. B and C had to be 10 units apart. Let's put a C there. That's 10. If that's true, then A and C had to be 13 apart. Are they 13 apart? They are. So that's the answer for A. If you're not sure how to do these, just try and label them and see, see what you can do. Now, B says another cross gives a frequency of 19 for A and D. Can you locate the position of D in this sequence? For B, the answer is no, because I could put D way over here, or I could put D way up here. So question C, or part C, then tells me if the crossover for C and D is found to be 6%, then can you look at where D would be? And the answer is you can. Let's draw the chromosome again. So let's put A there. Let's put B here. Those are three units apart. If I know that C and D is 6%, let's put C here, this was 10. If C and D is 6%, well, if I put D there, those are six apart. And what was A and D? A and D was 19. That would make this 19, which A and D are 19% across. Remember A and B were, um, what was A and B? A and B were, well, that was three. A and C was 13%, okay? So because I knew 
like when I didn't know the difference between C and D, I couldn't tell D was. But now I know the difference between C and D, which means it goes there. And overall, A and D are 19 percent across. OK, so I hope that was helpful to help explain why genes are linked and how you can tell if genes are linked using a problem. And I will see you guys next time.